Hey folks, what's going on? Welcome. Today we're going to be doing a fun little visual exercise and we're essentially going to create a style of push pin system. If you haven't seen this effect before, it's really popular. It's where we have this 3D kind of grid of objects and based on some kind of input texture or input data, we're able to extend and bring those pins back in Z space. So it's a very cool effect, very easy to use, and it's one that you can really get creative with and it can take only five minutes to set up. So let's get started. First thing I'm going to do is make a grid SOP because I want to be able to quickly have that grid worth of data. I don't want to go into chops and create my own grid. I want to take a grid geometry and just say, give me all that point data. I'm going to put a null SOP on the end of this. And then I'm going to create the geometry that I want to instance based on every point inside that grid. So I'll make a geometry comp. I'm going to go inside of it. I'm going to delete the torus and I'm going to make a new box SOP. And I'm going to turn on the render and display flags for it. Now I can go over to the instance page of that geometry comp, turn on instancing, and where I have my translate op and my translate X, Y, and Z, this is where I want to pull the data out of this beautiful little grid. So I'm going to go ahead and grab this null one SOP drop it onto translate op, and then I'm gonna go ahead and assign my P0, 1, and 2 as my X and Y, Z. And if this is unfamiliar for you, P is just short for position, N is short for normals, so you can always remember those by the name. So I'm gonna go ahead and put P0 as my X, P1 as my Y, and P2 as my Z. Now if I activate this viewer and kind of tumble around, it's going to look a bit messy and just like one solid block. And this is a very common thing that a lot of people encounter the first time they start instancing. And it's a really simple one. We have our grid and the grid size in 3D space is only one by one. And then if we go check our boxes, the boxes are also one by one. So you can imagine all of the boxes are essentially stacked on top of each other here. So there's two options. We could make our boxes smaller, but most times I actually like to just make the grid bigger because if you start making the boxes smaller, all of a sudden you're going to have boxes that are 0 0.001 in size and silly things like that. So we know that we have 20 by 20 rows here. So really, if we just make our grid also be 20 by 20 because our boxes are one by one, now we have a nice little grid that we can look at here. So now we can move on immediately into creating our push pin effect. And what we're really going to be looking to do is change the scale on the Z with some kind of data. Now, one of the really fun things I like to use is textures for this kind of data. That way you don't have to worry about, you know, doing too much shuffling or chop manipulation. And the nice thing about using textures is it's really visual. So if you're using maybe a blob tracking setup, it's really easy to feed in that data. If you have some nice movie textures, you can feed that data in. If you wanted to create generative noise or ramps, really easy also to feed that data in because we usually work with all these things in textures. So let me start with the simplest example here. First, I'm going to make a rectangle top. And I'm going to go ahead and connect this to a null. And I'm going to go on my geometries instance and I'm going to look for the scale op and I'm going to drag and drop null two on this scale. So now that I have null two on that scale, I'm going to go ahead and assign the scale Z to be any of my colors because we're going to assume that we're going to be working with monochrome here. So I can even go ahead and just assign the R channel. Now immediately we're going to see an error and this error essentially tells you that our two different data sources that are feeding into the instancing setup don't have the same length. And what that means is that over here, our grid has 400 points because it's a 20 by 20 grid of points. So our instancing is now kind of expecting there to be 400 boxes. And then when we want to add a scale, it's expecting 400 data points of scale. The problem is by default here, our size of our rectangle top is 256 by 256, which gives us 65,500 and some data points. So this is just telling you, hey, you know, the data amount of data isn't matching up here. So something I really like to do in this setup is use a fit top. It just provides us a little bit of extra safety. So that way we can kind of feel like we can plug anything in and at least know that there won't be any errors. 
Now in this case, I know that my grid is 20 by 20 rows and columns. So I could go over to my fit and just set the common resolution to be 20 by 20. And now you can see whatever's feeding in, regardless of resolution, it's gonna get down resed and it's going to appear inside of our instancing setup. Now I'm gonna make this instancing geometry viewer a little bit bigger here so that as we're playing around with stuff, it is easier to see, but you can already see here that just our rectangle is already making the areas where it's white inside of the data, extruding more on the Z, and the areas where there is no data or black pixels, they're essentially gonna be flat. Now, one of the things I highly recommend when you're working with this kind of texture setup that's feeding into an instancing setup is to actually use 32-bit pixels. Now, most of the time when we're working with pixels, if you middle click on them, you'll see that they're 8-bit fixed RGBA. If you're working with movie files, images, and just any kind of the default texture tops inside a touch designer, they're often going to be 8-bit. And what that means is that there's only a very small amount of value range for these data numbers. You know, there's only 255 little steps of data. And what you can see here is even though we have this, you know, edge that's blurring and falling off, Inside of our instancing, we just have a hard edge here. We just have a hard rectangle. Now, what we can do is switch this over in the common page. Most tops have this, and we go to the pixel format, and we're gonna force it over to 32 bit. Now, as we start working with this, not only are we gonna be able to push the ranges farther, but we're also just gonna get a lot more kind of intimate resolution between some of the different steps. And you'll see this as we start to go along here. So the first thing I'm going to do is just play with this a little bit and see what happens if I do things like rotate it. Already we can see that that's pretty fun. So maybe I can use a nice expression here. So I'll switch this over to Python mode and I'll type abs time dot frame. And now we can see as the frame counter in my timeline progresses, it's just going to continuously rotate this little extrusion that we got going on. Now I can do other fun things like for example, our fill color here is set to one, but since we're now working more with the data, we can actually make this even more. We can say make this eight. And now you can see it's gonna make that extrusion even bigger. Then we can go ahead and add things like maybe softness around the edges. And let's set that to be fraction and we'll just turn it up more and more here. And you can see now, instead of having a very kind of on or off binary amount of extrusion, you can see that the places where there's a lot more of this blurred fade out, it's only gonna be a little bit of extrusion, whereas the center here is gonna have that maximum extrusion for having that pure white value. So already we can do a lot of fun things with this, but this is where the creativity starts to come in because now that we have this texture-based setup that's very visual for us to work with, we can start to think about all the different kinds of textures we can feed into it. So maybe for example, I like this rectangle, but I also wanna have some generative noise. So I can go ahead and make a noise top. I can go into my common page. And for this one, I am actually going to resize it down to 20 by 20. And let me connect this to the fit. And you can see we already have a little bit of interesting stuff going on. But first, I always like to animate these kind of things. So I'm gonna go on the noise tops transform page of parameters. I'm gonna to go to the translate and on the TZ, I'm gonna turn on the expression mode and set abs time dot seconds. So that way, as long as my project is open and running, I'm just gonna get this seconds counter that's going to continue rising up and up. Now I'm gonna go back to the noise page and since this is a live kind of texture, I can start playing with some of the values. So maybe I take the offset down and you can see as there's more and more black pixels inside of my texture, those are represented by having very, very little or zero amount of scale on the Z. I can start to increase my amplitude so I can get bigger and bigger extrusions happening here. And then again, if you see something like this happening, what we see here is that even though I keep turning the amplitude up, it's almost looking like it's clamped. And that's because, like we said earlier, this is 8-bit fixed RGBA by default. Now, if I go ahead and switch this over to 32-bit, like I said, 
all of a sudden we have these huge bars because now the value range is unclamped. So that really demonstrates the importance of having those 32-bit pixel values here. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn down my amplitude a little bit just to make it a little less crazy. Now you can see some wild stuff going on here. And now you can even start to play with all of the different kinds of noise parameters. Maybe I want a little bit less exponent, maybe turn down the harmonic gain a bit, maybe turn up the period so I get these bigger splotches of movement happening. We could play with the harmonics here. The nice thing about this is that it's all very visual. So you could look at your noise and kind of almost even visualize what's going to happen on that 3D geometry instancing setup that we have, or you can even just look at it and see that representation come to life in 3D. Now noise isn't the only thing that we can do here. One of the fun things I like to do with these setups is also feed in movie files or video camera feeds. All of these things, as long as we can process them a little bit, can be fed right into this setup. So if I take, for example, this banana, I could go ahead and just plug it straight into the fit and we can see that banana outline is inside of our little grid here. Now this is working because if you remember, we only have our R channel feeding into the scale. Now in most cases, if you are going to work with textures in a setup like this, I highly recommend doing a bit of monochroming just so that you can make sure that all of your channels get added together into one uniform black and white kind of texture that feeds in and you know what to expect. Because sometimes you can have, you know, a texture like this where there is a lot of red in the red channel. Sometimes you might have blue images or blue textures and even though you feed them into the system, you're not seeing anything happen or maybe the effect is very minute. So it's always a good idea, especially if you're working with video camera feeds, uh, textures, videos, images, I highly suggest you monochrome them just so that you can actually see how that real data is going to be fed into the system. Now, as much as I love the banana, it is a little bit boring, so we can even try jumping over to something like maybe one of these Beeple clips that I have. Now, one of the things you're gonna notice, first of all, is that a lot of videos and textures and camera feeds, they're gonna have much more detail than you have available inside of your grid. So one of the things I like doing is using a threshold top to essentially eliminate a lot of the extra subtleties inside of these images. Because, you know, our, our pixel grid here, our little grid of boxes is not going to be very subtle. So I grab that threshold and feel free to just experiment. You can see how if I bring this threshold very low, I'm getting a lot of that content still coming through as just black and white. And the farther and farther I turn this up, it starts to exclude more and more and only really keep those strong, strong edges. So I can even just do this visually while watching my grid here. And I can say, you know what, somewhere around here, I'm getting a decent bit of information in there. Now you can do all kinds of things like use the softness to kind of introduce a little bit of ramping into that. So it's not just, you know, binary on and off pixels. You can blur things after that. One of the things I would recommend is if you are going to be using something like a video, an image, or a camera feed, turn up the resolution of your grid as much as possible. Because right now, 20 by 20, while it may be okay for something like a rectangle or even some simple noise, once you start to feed in a movie or an image or, or some more complex and detailed texture, you can see it really becomes hard to, to see what's going on. So in this case, maybe what I can do is turn this up to 50 by 50. So let's go 50 by 50 and immediately, remember that error, the same length error we get again because now we have to go to our fit and also set this to be 50 by 50. Now once we have that, even though we didn't change any of the other parameters, all of a sudden we have so much more resolution that we can work with. And actually what I would do here is also make sure to resize your grid to be 50 by 50. That way we don't have our boxes overlapping and now we can go back to playing with our threshold and figuring out what we want to do with that. Now this works really well for all kinds of videos. Uh, let's go over to the main touch designer folder here. We can even drop in something like good old count.mov and we can see that we can even make out some of the numbers in that texture. 
So now this is a very simple effect. You can control it however you want. The final thing I would do with something like this where I'm feeding in data from a video or a camera. So just remember that these are also almost always by default going to be 8-bit fixed textures. So maybe what I would do is starting from my threshold, go to the common page and set these to be 32-bit. And then that way from then on throughout any of the processing chain that I'm working on, I'm going to have those 32-bit textures, which are going to have a little bit more value range for me to work with. Now, in this case, what I could also do is put a math top on the end. And a math top is very helpful for workflows like this, because let's say we have, you know, only a tiny bit of this scaling on the z-axis happening, and we just want more. What I can do is go to the range page, and in this first area where it says from range 0 to 1, I can say, you know what, make that a range of 0 to 10. And now all of a sudden I have much more 3D depth because that zero to one range of values is getting stretched out to zero to 10 inside of that pixel space. And the math top, if you've never used it before, super helpful, works exactly like math chop, but for your pixels. So I hope that gets you up and running with this effect. It's a lot of fun. You can change out so many different elements of this. You know, it doesn't have to be a grid that you're starting from. You can go in and quickly swap out what geometry you're instancing, you can use circles, squares, boxes, custom geometry, whatever you want, and you can feed in just about any kind of texture, and as long as you process it correctly to get those white and black variations and shades in there, you're going to be able to displace these things very easily. Enjoy! Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you're serious about taking your touch designer and interactive skills to the next level, I highly recommend you check out the Interactive and Immersive HQ Pro. It's the only educational resource and community of its kind for touch designer and interactive professionals. You can learn more by checking out the link in the description. And if you like this video, don't forget to hit that like button. And if you're new here, don't forget to hit subscribe and the little bell icon for more awesome free content.